As my mother lay dying in a hospital 30 kilometers from her home, a neighbor whom we had never met wordlessly offered a pot of soup at our parents' door in rural Ontario. She left a name but no address, so it was only through considerable sleuthing that my sisters later tracked her down to return her pot with gratitude. That simple gesture, a large pot of soup, released the family from some of the burden of daily living during the hours of vigil at the hospital. At each of the hearty meals it provided, we gave thanks for our new friend's generosity in our silent but grateful eating. Preach the gospel. When necessary, use words. It turns out St. Francis of Assisi never said this. Rather, this saying derives from his prayer that his preaching might be an exam by example in obedience to God's holy rule. Actions speak for themselves, but sometimes, as in the case of Mary's anointing of Jesus, they are subject to the misinterpretation of words. Let's imagine what it means to preach without words. Some of you may have expertise in American Sign Language. For example, here is how you say thank you, which is sort of like blowing a kiss without puckering up. But these signs are also words, just unvoiced. Can you think of a time in your life when a gesture went beyond words, when an action spoke louder than any words could say, or when you offered someone nothing more than the bread of your presence, or an anointing through your undivided attention? In silence, I invite you to think back to one of those times, and then we're going to remember our uh, scripture. From John 12, Jesus is anointed by Mary. Think about the action, not how it's represented by the words of either Judas or Jesus. Think just about the action. Mary serves. Lazarus, Jesus, and Judas Iscariot sit at the table. Mary's wordless action dominates the scene. Punctuated by the pungent fragrance that fills the house. Even if you want to avert your eyes from the intimacy in the way she uses her hair to wipe Jesus' feet, your nose will not let you forget. You are drawn to the lingering evidence in the overpowering perfume that fills the house. While her action cannot be ignored, she offers no explanation or justification. It's a bold and daring act, made even more significant by silence. Silence speaks when words are not enough. But we protest. We are people of the book. So into the gap between motive and act, hearers and readers yearn to insert what Mary leaves out. What happens when we try to say what she might have said? Jesus has recently raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. Perhaps this extraordinary anointing should be understood as an offering of gratitude in response. Well, this explanation is speculative at best. There's no evidence to suggest that Mary rates her brother's life as equal to one year of a laborer's pay. For Judas, because the extravagance does not add up in his daily balancing of credit and debit, it is literally unaccountable. He criticizes what he cannot understand. Surely this huge outlay of money could have been used for greater benefit. He's right, of course, 
in the earthly economy of give and take, profit and loss. But this expenditure is in God's account book, however, which remains silent and demands our silence in return. For whatever the motive, Jesus receives the extravagant gift as an outpouring of Mary's deep love, just as he will soon wipe all of his disciples' feet in love, even though he knows one has lifted his heel against him. If we try, we might still smell that love that overwhelmed those gathered at Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' table. For many of us in the church, the account books have been, have been saying that our churches cost too much to maintain. Every region of the United Church knows the grief of the shutting and sale of much-loved buildings, whether urban or rural, large or small. So it may be with some bemusement that we hear about God's specifications through Moses for the construction of the tabernacle, a structure to protect the second covenant with God. In gratitude for God's mercy, the incident of the golden calf, they contribute their precious goods and skills to make not a graven image, but a movable home for their movable feast and worship. No expense is spared, no sensory experience left out. Lit by lamps and perfumed with incense, the tent and ark with its poles, clasps and pillars, the curtain at the entrance and the table with the bread of presence make sacred space for experiencing God's love. If you think about it, not much has changed except we expect our tabernacles to have foundations. I invite you to experience the space in which you worship today or have worshipped in the past constructed with no less attention to detail than that lavished on God's design for the tabernacle. Can you feel the care that has gone into making your chair comfortable, the wood smooth, or the cushion soft? Can you see the beauty in the colors that drape the sanctuary? Can you hear the rich music in the instruments? Do you discern the delicious smell of bread on the Sunday you celebrate Holy Communion, does your mouth water for the taste of tea or coffee around which you will gather with friends after worship? All of this has been prepared with love, the same love that filled the house with fragrance at Bethany, the same love that is stirred into the soup of condolence or baked into the cupcakes of celebration. The good news is that in our life together, we are blessed both to receive and preach the gospel of grateful love through the actions that embody our faith. In the week ahead, I challenge you to offer either a gesture or a prayer of thanks for a neighbor, whether near or far. A gesture of thanks for a neighbor, near or far. Amen.